Hello, friends and enemies, heroes and villains. Welcome to Epic Realms Presents Game Masters Workshop. We have some amazing guests for you today. They are all from the amazing Dungeon Scrawlers Twitch stream. First, I'd like to welcome writer, director, producer, Yang Yang Wang to the show. <laughs> How are you doing? Hey, doing all right. Doing all right. Awesome. Right next Excited to him. to be here. Right next to him is author, writer, archaeologist, Rhiannon Held, also known as RZ Held. I never know which one to type in when I'm posting social media. Like, what name do I use? How are you doing? <laughs> Good. Excellent, excellent. And of course, author, writer, Aaron M. <laughs> Evans is joining us as well here on the Game Hello. Master Workshop. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Great, great. I'm so excited. I'm glad to have all of you here. Uh, when I was putting you guys together as a group, I was like, they know each other. This is going to be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It's going to be really awesome. <laughs> but one of the things uh, that I noticed is that you guys, not all of you have a, you know, tens and twenties years of experience as GMing and as role playing. And I thought that would be a really good topic to talk about is, is, you know, getting the point of view of somebody who's only been doing it kind of recently. And I know what I had Rihanna and Aaron on, uh, the podcast you kind of these guys kind of mentioned that you kind of just dabbled your toes into order kind of just started and i thought this would be a great show to do so some of the questions i threw together kind of go in that direction uh of course our audience our live listeners live viewers uh can go ahead and throw their questions up and we can put our uh, uh our collective brains together and, and answer them but i want to ask yang yang well, tell us about your experience as far as role playing and gming goes because i am unaware and i, and I want to know um, yeah, so I've been playing D&D uh, &D ever since probably about a uh, second edition. Uh, I began with that edition when I was about like 10 or 11 years old. Um, I had a couple of other friends at elementary school and we would call each other, uh, we would call each other up on our phones and we would do like a conference call because that was like back in the day of conference calls. <laughs> and um, You've confused all the youths in the audience. <laughs> yeah, they're like, what's this, what's this guy talking about? Um, Is that like Zoom? And we would... It's like a group chat, but we're on the phone. Yeah, we're on the <laughs> phone, like actually talking to each other, like a bunch of 10 year olds just tying up the line. Cause back in those days, like <laughs> right. nobody else could make a call in. Uh, and yeah, we would do this for hours. And one of the, we would all play characters that we basically just made up. It was all just like a hundred percent homebrew at the time. And we just only took the rules that we could understand. Okay. And we played a first game as uh, Final Fantasy characters from the NES RPG. So we had somebody who wanted to be like uh, the ninja from that. So okay. we just like homebrewed what that would be like. Right, right. We had somebody else who wanted to be a character from Mortal Kombat. Uh, I believe it was Goro <laughs> from Mortal Kombat. Doesn't everybody want to role play somebody that's got extra arms, really? Yes. Yes, exactly. And then um, quickly it devolved into PvP, so we had homebrew rules for that. <laughs> and one of the kids uh, slaughtered all the others and took all their stuff and like <laughs> sold it all and retired. That was the end of my very first campaign. And here you are many years later, and you're with Dungeon Scrawlers. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Um, I feel like, I don't know if you've heard the story of our genesis uh i i've gotten pieces put together from each person that i've talked to between these two lovely people and eric's got to be uh i've i've got little pieces but i don't know if i've gotten the full the full story um i mean i'll probably also give you a brief one okay um, that's good we, that's fine. we we started playing together maybe about three years ago um before that we were playing off stream for about a year and none of us had played together before, except for maybe uh, Aaron and Eric, and maybe Rhiannon and Aaron. I had Aaron, never played with Eric. No. Okay, so none of us then. Okay. <laughs> Wait, no. You did, was, you played in my call contract game. That's when true. When I had to test run it for Game Holocon. So one time. <laughs> uh, yeah, so like Steven brought us together, actually. From the dungeon scrawlers okay. he wanted to put together like a like an author's D, &D uh stream and so he tried to figure out who he knew in the local seattle area and um you know each of us just came to it through serendipity and we've stuck together ever since that's awesome 
cool, cool. Well, let's get to our first question, shall we? Uh, and again, for the live audience, you guys can go ahead and ask your questions, throw them up in the chat, and we will do our best to get to them. So what is something that you guys didn't realize you needed to do as a GM? So before you start off, you're a player, you're doing stuff, you're gaming, and then you get your first session and you don't, you're like, oh, I had no idea that this was something I had to do, or this was something that was on me. Uh, we'll start with Aaron. Aaron, what's, when you, when you first got in the, there? So the very first time I DM'd was like well before this, and it was the thing that made me think I couldn't DM, um, that I very much approached it like a novel where I sort of knew how things would progress. And immediately my brother-in-law like went off, went off the track and I panicked, right? Because I, I had a story in my head and that's the shape of that story is wrong for this medium, right? right. You can't come in with the expectation that you're going to go from point A to point B, point C, right? You have to kind of go from like obstacle A to obstacle B or C um, and, and, and create space for the players to add things in. You're not telling them a story. You're facilitating the story they're telling. And that was, I think, my first big wake-up call. And I thought at the time, I went, oh, I just can't do this. I just can't do this. I won't do this anymore. It's fine. Um, because it absolutely, it just threw me completely. And it wasn't for, it was like years later, I got invited to Game Hole Con and they said, if uh, we'd love to have you as a guest, but if you come, you have to run a game. And I said, here's a fun fact. I've never successfully run D and D. Nobody knows it guys. Um, so that was the first time I did that. And I put together a game that was sort of like part, and this is actually, I think this, I think this jumps into a, to future questions. If I remember what you showed us previously, but I think um, solving a mystery is a great structure for a D and D game. Cause you, you have sort of clues that you've placed and the way that they move between the clues is up to the players. Um, and you can kind of entice them through the setting, through this chain of clues to let them figure out what's going on. So it's a, it's a murder mystery dating sim with Dragonborn basically. And it was a lot of fun. And it made me realize that maybe, maybe I could do this. Nice. Brandon, what about you? Something you didn't realize you needed to do as a GM until you started GMing. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I'm thinking back to, because um, my kind of first experience with GMing was in MUDs, so text-based okay. role-playing, um, which is a little bit of a different feel. Um, and there, like my first, I think the first um, sort of plot is what they were called is a set of scenes that as a uh, GM you were uh, running a plot so maybe over like a week you'd have um, five or six different scenes that you ran as part of that so it's kind of a one shot but not quite right. um, and my first one went really well and um, then my second one like crashed and burned and people were really frustrated with it um, and it was the same thing about like um, running on sort of railroad tracks too much um you know the sort of for me that's an eternal problem but i think that the first time it was a little bit more of sometimes what i shoot for now which is the zoo train experience which is that like it's there you're like look it's a train it's a train it's cool and it cool like it goes to this cool place and it goes to that cool place would you like to get on the train and then you have people's buy-in a little bit yeah. and they sort of understand that like okay, this is a haunted castle or something. So there are different rooms and different things in each of the rooms. But when you have people's buy-in, they're a little bit less likely to get frustrated that they can't leave the castle and, like, go climb the mountain next door. Right. Um, and I think that the second time I did one, there was I didn't get my buy-in set up. So they were, I was sort of like, here's the cool castle with the rooms. And they were like, yeah, but that lake, that lake, I want to see if there's a monster in it. And I had no monster to put in the lake. And I was just like, no, the wall is too high. <laughs> yeah, that, kind of, that kind of beginning, yeah. <laughs> the lake we, we've all done that. We've because all done of that. E. coli. <laughs> yeah. Right. Definitely. <laughs> so. Yang, what about you? Uh, is it okay if I give two? Because sure, my first answer yeah, is very sure. similar. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so first off, you know, just like uh, Aaron and Rhiannon, um, I think something that would have really helped my players, 10-year-old DM me, uh, should have set the tone of what the adventure is supposed to be. So I should have just said, like, right out of the gate, like, no PvP. Uh, let's all just know each other and like each other from the get-go. 
And uh, this adventure is going to be a sandbox adventure, but please follow this major epic quest. Right. Like it's not a true sandbox. Um, yeah. And then the other thing that I learned real quick was to have a bunch of like backup NPC names, backup names for little creatures, because inevitably your players are going to want to be their best friend, like random tavern maid <laughs> in the tavern. They will just role play with her for four hours and they want to know her entire life story. You will never predict who they'll, who they'll, what they'll gravitate to, you know? Right. We do have a stream question, uh, and I'm not sure which of you this really applies really well to. Uh, and I, I know... Uh, Fight for it. So, yeah. how is prepping to, a, to GM or DM a game for a broadcast different than prepping for just a table with, your, with players or friends? Aaron, you want to give us a start? Mm. I know you've got a little experience with that. So... Yeah, so I will say that the difference at this point in my life, the games that I play not on broadcast are with 10-year-olds. Uh, and I don't prep. <laughs> because basically, uh, they they only pay attention to... They pay attention to very little. Like, you'd be like... <laughs> you'll be like sending them hints like, you should be talking to this NPC. This NPC is trying to engage with you. And they're like, we're good. Like... They did just kind of tell you that you you should know before you go into the castle what's inside the castle. Now you need to ask them about the castle. Like it's probably just castle. Like okay, okay, you're gonna fight a Jabberwock and it's not gonna be on my head. So I don't really, <laughs> I don't really prep for those. Uh, I I do kind of skim. We're right now we're running wild beyond the witchlight. So I I will like kind of go through like okay you're about here you're gonna have this, um and and I'll have like encounters kind of pulled up. I don't don't really prep for it um for a stream for grown-ups with an audience um i've actually gotten to a point where i prep a lot less the first couple times that i dm for dungeon scrawlers i had a huge outline with links between different documents depending on who they talked to first and by the end i was like okay this is what the first kind of conversation is i practiced the voice i had a couple of um of important pieces of information that I needed them they needed them to be able to get that I needed to tell them in that moment as soon as they got into conversation and then it was like okay and then they're going to go into this castle and these are the options for going into the castle so these are the potential encounters and I just went with it and I made stuff up but based on what they did and it I felt a lot more comfortable than I ever expected because when I especially when I started like my first couple of experiences DMing I have I have these like ex just huge files of like of places and the things you can buy and all the NPCs you can talk to. Um, it made me feel a lot more prepared and comfortable. But once I got settled and into it, and I played with these guys for so long, um, I felt much more confident just kind of rolling with it. And so then when I did, um, I DM'd for Idol Champions Presents, um, and that one I had sort of in between because these were new new players, and so I like needed notes about what they could do and like what might happen um, so that I was ready. But also just not having too much built up because you need to be able to roll with it, right? And and so if they go after something and you've got all this prepped. Right. You either need to be able to move that or you need to be able to spin up something new. And it's a lot. I felt like it was a lot easier when I wasn't, you know, if I didn't have things locked down real hard. Right. Can I can I piggyback off that real quick? I would definitely love you to piggyback off that. Jump on. <laughs> um, <laughs> jumping on. So um, <laughs> I feel like I feel like preparation, no preparation is wasted. Like the nice thing about over preparing is then the world and the characters in it are very real for you. And on the fly, it's much easier for you to create uh, a sense of immersion and to draw your players into it if you have all of these little bits like already floating in there, basically, versus starting off as a blank slate and having to create it uh, purely uh, on the spot. So even if you do tend to over prepare, um, you can over prepare but not let that restrict you. You don't have to like ex explicitly stick to the script that you prepared in your head or to you know who the bbeg is you know etc you can make these on the fly decisions and like ground it in that preparation like you know you need a bbeg that's a caster that has lived for a thousand years you know etc you can pick another choice if the players decide to go somewhere else and encounter 
you know, somebody else, etc. But you don't necessarily have to write all the dialogue out. Exactly. Yeah. Which moment is to what moment. I did is... in the beginning. As, <laughs> as the person that you know works on some of the behind the scenes stuff in the production, what kind of other things do you have to look at, Gang Gang, when putting together like when Dungeon Scrolls is going, as far as running the running the show while there's role playing going on? And of course, you're also a player. Um, yeah, I will say that it's real different for me uh, when we were playing <laughs> with Gen Con doing all the production mm -hmm. versus me doing the production, because I almost have like this divided two selves, like right. I'm always like listening and trying to like keep myself in the scene and stuff, but also I'm checking sound levels constantly. I am uh, looking at chat constantly. To see if there's any like issues if people like are confused you know where the code is etc uh we have a wonderful team of mods but you know i i'm a little anxious about production and um <laughs> i try to yeah always keep an eye on the time and make sure that we're timely and uh, i feel like yeah i'm just being like a stage manager essentially on top of it right tracking the little details uh roll 20 also like making sure that we're looking at the right place of the map we're like prepared to show the right picture right. that the, the GM wants. If your roll 20 is in the background and they change something, it doesn't update, and you have to make sure it's on the forefront on whatever device <laughs> you're using. <laughs> I know what you're yeah. talking about. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, if, you want, if you ever want to be the producer for a stream, you really need to pay attention to the details. You need to be able to track a lot of moving pieces. I feel like it is the same skill set as like a stage manager for a theater play or um, uh, like a first uh, first assistant director on like a set. Right. Brandon, about you, when you're when you're running on a stream, difference between when you're on stream and off stream role playing. Yeah. So um, I I have a little bit of a different perspective just because I ha I haven't actually uh, GM'd uh, like a TTRPG right. in person. Like I've only done it on the stream, and then I've only done the muds. Okay. Um, and so uh, I did a lot of prepping for when I did it on the stream um, of typing up descriptions um, because uh, I'm not a super visualizer. Like I have a little bit of visualizing, but not strongly. And so when I'm writing, I have time to sort of make up for that. I know it's a, a weakness. And so I like spend some more time like thinking real hard about like what the situation looks like. Um, and I knew going in, that under the pressure of the time, like I would be visualizing nothing. <laughs> so I needed to have stuff like ready there. Like what does the interior look like? What does the landscape look like? That sort of thing. Um, I didn't do writing out dialogue because I knew that that's something that flows. And so right. I wanted to be able to, to get into the moment with it. Um, but for MUDS, um, my prep was almost all like sort of mental planning stuff out because when you're doing the text-based and you're doing a text-based post to respond to somebody, um, I really valued being able to um, change how I'm saying what I'm saying based on the situation. Um, and if I'd had like pre-written things that I was like slotting in and then writing a little around them, I felt like I wouldn't be able to sort of do the, the tone properly and change the tone, but that's all like text-based versus being in the stream and having it be verbal and your, you know, how you're performing it. Right. Sure. All right. Here's our next question, guys. What is something you realize you can do as a player to help other GMs that you didn't realize was a thing until you started GMing? So, you know, you're a player, you're a player, and then you're a GM. It's like, man, I could have done this to help the other GMs. Now that I'm a GM, I realize, gosh, this would have really helped. Um, I'll, I'll give an example. Going along with the story, a lot of people, when you're just playing and you don't really GM, and you're like, oh, but I, like you said, I want to go over to that mountain instead of into the castle. After you've GM'd, you're like, well, the GM wants me to go into the castle. I'll go into the castle. Uh, and that's just my, <laughs> that's my example. Uh, uh so Rhiannon, we, we just chatted with you. Go ahead and if you want to pull us from there and, and, and take it off. Yeah, I think mine would be sort of a, an offshoot of that is um, in terms of, I feel like I try to be tuned into the GM as far as um, 
what I should investigate. Um, because there's like your actions and what you do, but I definitely think that um, I'm really sad when I have something that's just cool. Like not even advancing the story or anything like that, but I, I put some work into like this detail or this cool thing and nobody happens to want to look at it. Um, but on the other hand, there's the sort of like, well, I'm going to go look at this wall while this wall is blank. And so the GM is like, uh, well, there's some writing on it. Um, and then you're like, oh, what does the writing say? And then they're scrambling. And so I feel like I try to tune in to like, see if I can sense when the scramble is happening because I want to find the cool thing they made ready for me. I don't necessarily right. want to just find like random stuff that they scramble to make up and force them to make it up. And so I'm like, oh, okay. Like, I'm definitely going to go look at, I mean, in video game terms, the like properly rendered object on the table, as opposed to the like, <laughs> background map. The one that has the glow around it right. that says, pick me up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and just because, like, um, even story aside, I I am interested in what the GM is interested in. And so if they put the work into making details about this, I want to find them out. Aaron, how about you? I think the thing that popped in, well, I know the thing that popped into my head is I, um, like, as a player and as a, a GM, what I want is to um, find a story that pulls the characters together, right? That creates interesting character arcs in addition to whatever plotty thing I'm doing. Right. Um, and so I would say one thing is really communicating with the DM what that is and what you want, because, uh, you know, it's hard to guess sometimes. Um, and, and especially, you know, if you are sort of, thinking of course you understand based on what i'm doing what it is um other people might be picking up different things based on the way that they tell stories the kind of characters they like they might be missing pieces of it so like when i dm um when i dm for when i dm for kids i'm basically like okay you want to fight everything and you want to talk to people and you want to use that one spell every single time. <laughs> and so setting up situations for that, cool. They don't want things that are very complicated at this point, maybe in the future. Um, but when for like adults, I like to go and go like, okay, well, what do you want out of your character? What beat do you want to hit? Tell me and I will think of something where I can I can kind of feed that back to you and we can kind of create a story together. Um, but you know, that sort of like, like, guess what number I'm thinking of kind of thing is really hard on both sides. So having good communication about what you want out of the game and what you are trying to do with your character. Right. Um, I think that's huge. And that's a great skill on both ends, whether you're GM or a player to make sure, talk to your players, find out, mm -hmm. find out, if, tell them what you want or find out what they want. That's, that's great, great advice. Yang Yang, how about you? Things as a GM that you're like, oh, I should have, I should do this more as a player now. Um, yeah, I think uh, especially you know as we as D and D has changed editions, right? And uh, I've made more and more character builds. I think especially in fifth edition, sometimes the wording of rules can get a little soft. So I know everybody's like really excited to create uh, certain character concepts with certain mechanics or combinations of spells, magic items, etc. Um, I think what would be really helpful uh, for your DM is if you have something that you're really relying on that is like core to the being of your character um, and it is like a questionable interaction. So uh, I'm just going to make one up off the top of my head and this is not right. legal. It's like you are a wild shaped druid and you want to uh, transform into an elephant and the elephant's trunk you want to turn into like a heavy weapon and then have some sort of heavy weapon feat, you know, interaction. Um, if you think if you think of that concept, pass it by your, your GM and work together to see if it's A, possible, or B, what else you can do instead. Um, if your character relies on some really obscure rules, um, like a lot of shoving and grappling and mounted combat, you know, <laughs> et cetera, uh, give your GM a heads up so that they could prep ahead of time. Right. And so it's not something that you just spring on them at the table. And then, you know, we have to take like a 15, 20 minute break to look up the rules, maybe debate some things or just have the DM tell you like, 
that doesn't work at all. Right. Like, what do right. you think it works like? Or so the GM can like give you that thing because there have been times mm -hmm. where I've seen where people have made a character and they're like it's based around this one thing for combat or whatever, but then they never get to use it. And yeah. the GM doesn't know that that's what they want to do and what they want to use. So just say, hey, I've got this, you know, I'm a grappling. I like to throw them and put them in different situations. Give me a chance to, can I have a, you know, a chance to do that? And so then the GM can play and fight. So yeah, and that's just a spin off of what you said. But yeah, that's definitely a great, great suggestion. I have a question that's mostly for Rhiannon. Uh, this yep. person I'm willing to bet remembers the podcast episode based on what's this, what this is saying. Many GMs like to describe what's going on, where things are, etc., without a map. But I also can't really picture things when they are described. As a player, how do you work with that when there are no map or visual aids? Oh, interesting. Because um, I think you so, had mentioned something like that when you were on the show talking about yeah. trying to do things, write things in your books that are, you know, people that can't mm -hmm. visualize things can, can get by with. Yeah, I mean, so it's it's not great for mechanical wise. I feel like, right? Um, and and maybe that's a lesson that I'll take to to jamming is I made a map, but it was just for sort of people to have a layout. But then people were like, "Oh, where's where's my token on this? Mm -hmm. Where am I like walking around?" I'm like, well, "You're vaguely there. <laughs> that's not what it's for. There's no monsters. I don't do monsters yet." Um, but I feel like uh. How I visualize is a um, dress uh, tech rehearsal um, for a stage play um, so that, like, maybe there's one prop or two, um, but the um, set's not really quite there and the costumes aren't really quite there. But you you at least have, like, people sort of in, in association with each other and, like, a key prop. And okay. so I feel like... Um, as far as doing a combat, if I know that, like, I'm near or far from something and, like, how far my spells reach, um, that's enough. That's, like, the key information. Um, and so I'm not necessarily looking as a player to be able to, like, see in my head the way the spell sizzles onto the whatever. Right. Um, so I don't need the, the GM to be trying to, to give that to me. I'm just sort of like... Um, is it super hurt? Because that's what I'm focused on. Right. Like, not what it looks like, but the the result of it. What about when somebody's explaining, like, this is, a, you know, this is what the room looks like, but you don't have a picture, and you're dealing with people that can't picture that? Do you, um, do you approach it with some of the same approach that you've done with, with writing? And the, the others can, add, you know, pitch in on this as well, if, it's, if they yeah. feel they have info. I think my advice would be, um, to not have the fact that maybe somebody isn't picturing it very well be a failure point. Because I feel like if you're getting heavily into a puzzle and you're making it kind of like an escape room, it can be super important that, like, there are three holes over there and two holes over there and you have a long something or other and you can put three in, in one and two in the other and then, like, vault over it and that's high enough to get you up to the... And, for that, the spatial relationships of all those holes in the pole and the where you got to climb up to are incredibly important. And I think that if there's somebody in your players who can't visualize very well, they will not get that. Right. So either one of the other players has to be super visual and say, okay, I have an idea for this pole that we're going to set in these holes. Or you have to have a different kind of puzzle where it's like, okay, you have like numbers scratched on the wall and you need to add them together and then there's you scratch another number so that it's not about the spatial relationships that will make the puzzle not work anymore because for me as the player like when I get the sense that a puzzle like that is happening I'm like oh god oh no <laughs> <laughs> like when somebody's going into the like there's a 10 foot pole and there's a five foot step and there's three holes over there. I'm like, Oh God. Um, so not making stuff rely on that right. or knowing that other players who like super love it, if you want, they love it and you want to give it to them, give it to them, but know that the non visualizer won't be providing the solution. Yeah. And I think that's a thing just in general for people to realize as a GM, that there are people that don't visualize what you're explaining to them. They can't close their eyes and picture it. It just, you know, 
Aaron Yang, either of you have any input on this on this subject that you'd like to uh, add to? Uh, yeah, but if Aaron, you had something, do you want to go first? No, I I feel like Rhiannon hit it pretty well, so I'm I'm good. Um, yeah, so kind of related even to the last question, uh, you know, what can you do as a player to help your DM or GM? Um, I take a lot of notes. So uh, I am constantly taking notes at the table, and uh, I'm also not a person who really, like, visualizes very um, clear pictures in my head. So um, whenever I enter a space and the DM begins, like, describing the room, I just take notes of, like, key features. So, like, I don't need to write down the whole description. If there's a bookshelf, I could just write bookshelf and then, you know, a question mark next to it. And that's my own shorthand to remind myself to investigate that bookshelf later on. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I just basically use a note system with keywords to stand in for pictures. And I might write something like, you know, N, W, E, uh, S for like the cardinal directions that are, you know, doorways that are open. Cause you know, once upon a time I also used to play MUDs and that's mm -hmm. how you navigate it is you just type in the, the letter. That's the direction that you want to go. Um, so besides like taking really good notes, uh, and then asking, the DM for uh, repetition. Um, I find that another good shorthand for combat is you just say, I have a spell, I have firebolt. It's got a 30 foot range. Will that hit this monster? And then your DM could just say yes or no. So you just, you know, try to explain really succinctly your range and your intent. And then the DM probably has it contained in their own head. Right. And then they'll be able to tell you, yeah, whether it's possible. I think there's also something to be said about having knowledge and and again telling your your gm like you know i can't do this and then realizing it's still role playing so if they can't visualize that there's still other avenues such as hey can i roll a dice to figure out this or get a key part to help the other players in you know if it's a big long puzzle then at least maybe they can help you out you can make a roll and be like yeah the the pole is very needed for this and it has something to do with the holes you know because you've made a roll in that way even though you couldn't visualize it, you see you and your character were still able to help solve the puzzle without sitting back and going, I'm useless. Because I know, mm -hmm. I know that sometimes there is that whole, you know, I can't contribute to this and the GM's got to, you know, be able to help and, and make sure that everyone can contribute to something like that. So what are, speaking of puzzles, what are some of your guys' favorite puzzles you've used? <laughs> Um, I mean, I could just jump off first. Yeah, go for it. So, uh, we did do like a murder mystery, it's supposed to be one shot, ended up being like a three shot. <laughs> uh, as, as all our one shots do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but one of the puzzles in there was um, a puzzle with books and bookmarks. <laughs> and uh, the bookmarks. Oh, Emily crushed it. Emily crushed it. Like, if you're good with escape rooms, this is, like, essentially escape room thinking. Uh, but the three bookmarks were red, blue, and green. And the there were six books in front of you, and they were all closed, and it was labeled accounting I through um, VI. So, like, Roman numerals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And the players would have to put the bookmarks into the books in the correct order uh, in the correct combination in order to get a secret door to open should i just tell the solution mm -hmm. okay i think so <laughs> uh so the solution was to um take a look at the number of letters in the colors of the bookmarks so there was red blue and green red is three letters blue is four letters green is five letters so red goes into book three blue goes into book four Green goes into book five. Nice. Literally, he finished explaining the puzzle, and Emily went boom, boom, boom. Yep. I was, like, <laughs> I, was well. ready to, I was like, okay, ready to solve it. She's like, I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But and you've somebody... done that in yourself, Aaron, in an escape room oh. we were both in, where you well. like came on the scene, saw the puzzle, and were like boom, 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 and we're yes. in the next room, and I, I like stayed room. to like work it out to see like what you just done. <laughs> <laughs> Ran and Aaron, what about puzzles that you guys uh, have come okay. up with? Or... I, I, 
I see. I I don't know that I've done a lot of puzzles like that. I like the sort of broader -er puzzle of what yeah. the hell is going on. Okay. Um, but I have one that someone else did. Can I tell that yeah, story? Yeah, definitely for sure. Okay. So because we're giving uh, ideas to other people, and they're you know people don't think alike. So part of me is like I shouldn't even tell you guys this because this is this is like above and beyond. Okay. But Susan J. Morris. Um, I was going to say of... above and beyond. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Susan is um an extraordinary dm she puts a lot of effort into making her games really cool um and she built one uh, puzzle for us where we we i don't even remember where exactly we were but we came up and it was basically like a riddle to figure out which of these two things do we need to mix together and then she turns to this table at the side of the room that's covered and pulls off this cloth, there are all these little bottles on the table. And there is this clay dish that she's made, which has this sort of labyrinth in the middle. Like it, like there's channels all through it and there's two little funnels. And so she's like, okay, see if you figure it out. Um, and when we got it right, what she had done was she had taken some glow sticks and she had separated, because there's like a, a tube of one chemical inside the middle and then there's another one on the outside. And, and she had sort of separated some glow sticks like this. So when you poured them in, as they met in the middle, this glow spread out through the, the whole thing. And it was so magical. Um, she she's really puts a lot of effort. And then she burns out, to be honest, because it's a lot of work, right? Um, so you get that that little slice of time. And for a long time, this was also why I'm like, oh, I can't DM. <laughs> I, can't, <laughs> I can't hit that. But I realized you can have a lot of fun not doing that. But she was always really good for puzzles and a lot of props and uh, just a generally cool experience. She ran uh, one shot for us. She did her Thief's Night uh, one shot, uh, which I had actually played before, and it did not matter one bit. It was still so much fun to go through. Nice. That's fun. Brandon? Um, I'm also not like a big... I mean, which is funny because I love escape rooms. Right. Yeah. But I don't necessarily think of, of putting that <laughs> like, into my You guys myself. do the puzzle. I'll solve it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, admittedly, like the one that I did for stream was an archaeology based one. Um, and there was there was an aspect of that there was a um room that they came across and I I forget which way it went, but I had prepped so that if you couldn't see how to get in one way, you could see how to get in another way. Um, and that, so that was a little bit of sort of an, an archaeology puzzle because it wasn't like you could find different doors. It had one door, but the wall was thin on one of the other ways, which is sort of more like you'd find in an archaeological situation where um, you're not constrained by how it was built anymore. You're constrained by where the big root grew or the underground river has washed away or things like that. So you're trying to find your way around to get to it safely. And so that I think was a little bit of the puzzle was figuring out the safe route in, which is kind of kind of what you do with archaeology, like right. figure out the safe route to excavate things. Um, but you're not putting the excavators at risk and you're not putting any of the material at risk either. Yeah. And that's that's a good good way of, you know, showing the differences between puzzles because that's still a puzzle. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's not not like the one Yang Yang was talking, but it's still a puzzle. You know, something that someone mm -hmm. has to figure out and solve. And obviously, you've got you know a little background in that that help, that helps with those. And I think uh, I think that's super cool. Uh, uh, can I just talk about puzzles design in general? Yeah, for sure. So uh, number one, you know. I think it takes a particular type of brain to design uh, a particular type of puzzle that is both um, intuitive, like the players can look at the puzzle in of itself. They don't need to like Google anything or whatever and extra stuff and have everything they need to get it and solve it. Um, a lot of puzzles, and I will say like even ones in the D&D &D, uh, setting books, adventure books, uh, I find sometimes a little frustrating um, because it's not intuitive enough. And there is essentially that that fine line between uh, fun figuring out and like frustration. Right. And and so um, if you are making so first of all, don't be afraid to just go online and just search up cool puzzles. Right. And just steal those. Uh, but if you are <laughs> designing your own, then try to make it like 
fun and delightful or interesting, uh, but not necessarily difficult because you want your players. It's such a joyous feeling to get it and right. then like mm -hmm. try something and then, you know, something else unlocks or happens. Uh, you want to give them that feeling. You don't want them to feel frustrated uh, just so you as the GM could be like, oh, ho, ho, I have such a clever puzzle. <laughs> like, why didn't you <laughs> know that the 38th star and the 12th moon uh, needed to touch and unlock the door? Like, I don't know. Right. We have somebody in chat goes, also, don't be afraid to use puzzles or don't be afraid to use riddles from children's coloring books. I'm guessing there's, <laughs> yeah. I'm guessing there's a story to that, but that's a great, that's a great, uh, it's a great suggestion. <laughs> all right, guys. I think too, like, 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 you know, we are, we all love escape rooms, but the, the, the thing you do, especially if you're doing it on stream, right? Like, think about being in an escape room and how much of the time is you being like, okay, right, da, da, da. Mm -hmm. and that's fun for you. But if someone is watching you do math problems on a piece of paper, that's not entertaining. That's so true. even more simple so that we get to the like the aha moment, because that's the fun part for people who are watching. Yeah. Um, that's that, that yeah, watch figuring out the puzzles is fun, but it is not a necessarily a spectator sport. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Uh, I like that. That's funny. Um, for everybody watching, uh, we are going to take a quick little 10 minute break. So feel free to get up and stretch or hang out and chat and chat with each other and come up with questions. Feel free to do all of that. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, you stretch your legs and use the rest of <laughs> <laughs> And we will there. talk about that. We will talk about that. <laughs> Just take uh, your 10 minutes. Go pre-order Empire of Exiles. Yeah, there you go. You'll be ahead of the curve. So we'll be right back in just a short bit. <laughs> so uh, take care and uh, we'll chat with you in a few seconds, minutes. Like, Hello, everybody. While we step away for a break, I want to take this time to tell you about our current stream sponsorship. I do this show, the podcast, and everything else I do on here, and you guys all make it great. And I want to give you something back that makes it great. And it will also help us because, again, we're being sponsored. Uh, when we got our Magic Spoon sponsorship, I really couldn't tell you what things tasted like or what they were like. I could only tell you what I had heard. And I've got them now, and I've gotten to try them. My wife's gotten to try them, and we we like them. Uh, some of them we really, really like. And, you know, I, was, I told you what I told you, and I'm going to continue to be honest with you. Uh, I personally, I'm a fan of the peanut butter. I've got the peanut butter right here. Look at this. Boom! Peanut butter. I like the peanut butter. My wife's not a big fan of the peanut butter. She really likes the fruity. One thing we do agree on is the texture is amazing on all of them. Uh, and like I said, we like them all. We don't dislike any of them. We haven't been like, oh, this is horrible. That has not happened yet. So um, they're like zero grams of sugar. They're four to five grams of carbs. So it's it's really, really healthy and it doesn't taste like it's healthy. Another thing for me that makes it really awesome is it's celiac friendly. I'm a celiac. They're gluten free. They don't taste gluten free, guys. They taste like cereal. Uh, it's just, I, I can't, I can't tell you how excited I am because I don't normally get to eat, you know, I get pretty bland cereals or super expensive cardboard cereals when it comes to gluten-free and this, this just isn't that. Um, it's also keto friendly. It's super healthy. Again, it doesn't taste super healthy. Another thing that most people don't realize is this thing's got like 13 to 14 grams of protein in it. And maybe you don't know, but Protein kind of kickstarts your metabolism in the morning. So if you don't get a lot of like protein in the morning and you're like, why is my metabolism so slow? Why do I feel sluggish in the morning? Protein intake helps increase your morning metabolism and helps you build that throughout the day. So it really gets your body going in the morning. And this for cereal, uh, that that's a lot of grams of protein. So you can get your good protein morning intake with cereal in the morning and it's quick and easy and it tastes good. Here's another thing you don't know. They do granola bars. If you're a granola person, if you're like, I got to get up in the morning and I got to leave and I got to go, 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 you can get granola bars. Throw a couple of them in your purse, throw them in your wallet. Not in your wallet. They probably won't fit. But in your pocket, in your lunchbox, wherever, wherever you throw your granola bars. And bring them with you as you go. They're super tasty, super awesome. Um, so another thing I want to let you guys know is that you can use our code. It's STREAM1901. They ship to U.S., Canada and UK. Guys, my Canada and UK people, where are you at? We got some cereal for you. So pick it up. Uh, so thank you so much for listening to this. 
continue to hang out with me. I love that you guys support me. Feel free to check out Magic Spoon. If you feel like you want to try some cereal, if you eat cereal normally, try it out. There's you, you're not you don't you're not losing anything. You're still going to the store to buy it. So try this out. It might be a couple extra dollars, except for I'm giving you five dollars off. Stream 1901, guys. Thank you so much. And we'll get back to your show in just a little bit. <laughs> Glad y'all came to our hoot, Nanny. Good to see you, boss. How you, you enjoying yourself so far? Hey, get her another L on me. Now, get her two L's on me. Alexa team partnered with Paizo and wanted to do uh, basically a role-playing video game that was entirely audio. So it's kind of halfway between, you know, a computer RPG and halfway between like an audio choose your own adventure. I was going to say. Um, yeah. And so like, it's fun because it's this thing. Hello, and we are back from break. Again, everyone, this is Epic Realms Presents the Game Master's Workshop. We are with many of the Dungeon Scrawlers from the Dungeon Scrawlers Twitch stream. You guys can check them out at Dungeon Scrawlers right here on Twitch. You guys also have a, a website, right? Mm -hmm. Is it just DungeonScrawlers.com? I don't have it up. I just said it, it was like, It is oh, indeed. We're talking yep. about it. I better <laughs> say where it's at. <laughs> bow, 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 bow. Yep. We are joined by writer, director, and just producer, right? You're just like the main producer guy. Man. Yang Yang <laughs> Wang. Done a lot of things. <laughs> a lot of things. Uh, uh, writer, author, Rhiannon Held. Also writer, author, Aaron M. Evans, who has a new book out we just talked about. Uh, is <laughs> I just also, shoved in your Just faces. shoved in our faces. <laughs> yeah. uh, are all joining us <laughs> to talk about role playing. Uh, we've had a great first half of the show. And we've got a couple more questions here that we're going to get to. Um, somebody did mention earlier, and I want to scroll back real quick. Um, and try and find exactly somebody said a good puzzle needs a lot of hints maybe your players will get it right away but if not plenty of hints can help uh can can come out one by one and help them out and mm -hmm. i think we kind of mentioned Definitely. that earlier when we were talking about puzzles even escape think, rooms have hints yeah right yeah. right so i just I wanted that, to that extends out into a lot of things as a dm like if you get into a situation where you're like they don't get what i'm going for Waiting and waiting for them to guess the number you're thinking of is not fun for anybody. Mm -hmm. um, so having lots of ways to pull them towards the goal is, or ways to shift the goal yeah. is important. And I think skill checks can help too. Cause like I always say, mm -hmm. I, I, not only do I always say it, but oftentimes you hear players <laughs> say, well, my wizard's a lot smarter than I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, He could probably figure this out. Uh, so, so giving them the chance to, you know, get that information from their character as well. As a player, how do you try and work your own story stuff into the game? And we touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, so when your character has a story hint or whatever, um, and the GM doesn't have it planned, how do you try and get that across? How do you try and do you try and just go directly to the source and be like, hey, I want to tell the story? Or do you try and like tell the story in character when you're role playing? And this can go on uh, whether you're on stream or off of stream. Uh, yeah, again, you want to start us off? I know your time is a little bit more limited today. So if you want to uh, yes. hop in. Um, yeah, so I'm definitely the type of player who is a little more um, objective first or like plot first uh, rather than like character first. So um, I try to keep my characters very like malleable. Like I know certain like keywords for my characters, um, like they might be tragic, they might be sympathetic, they might be um, hot headed, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, I try to like, quote unquote, like discover you know, something in the story, uh, moments in the story to sort of latch onto and develop my character further. Okay. Um, usually I might start with like a strong motivator, like revenge. They want revenge on something. Uh, they're looking for a MacGuffin, you know, something right. like that. But I might not define it so strongly or I'll just tell the GM and let them decide, you know, what that will be. What do I, you know, what's the target of my revenge? What is the MacGuffin? And then I just use the character um, as flavor, 
the characteristics as flavor for certain actions or dialogue. And whenever I find a moment where my character's needs and the you know things I've set up, like trying to find the MacGuffin, intersect with the story that the DM has presented, that's when I know, and I think the DM usually knows, um, that's when I so have sort of like my character spotlight moment. But I just like wait for it to happen. Right. Brianna, how about you? Um, I feel like I have been influenced by, by many years um, playing in MUDs as well. Um, and there, um, you are very much um, in charge of your own story. And there tends to be more sort of like just generalized, like having coffee between characters with them talking kind of stuff going on. Right. Um, and so if you need a turning point or something for your character, um, you have got to start to set that up. Um, and so I think that I came into D&D with the sense that um, if I want my character to have, say, a turning point, um, I am thinking ahead of time of the types of moments that might act as that turning point. Um, and then might one of those come up? Um, and so I tend to, since I'm very like character focused, um, I do tend to ask the um, GM or another player or something like that, not can we do X, Y, Z, but having identified that, um, oh, I don't know, somebody drowning would be a huge turning point for my character. Um, is there a way that we could go to the seashore or something? Right. Um, so it's not saying I need to have this happen. It's saying... Um, can we go to an environment or create an environment where that is a very likely possibility and then it I can work it in um, without I think feeling like you're sort of having to drag it over to something that's like so specific yeah yeah definitely Aaron how about you um, I think the thing I mentioned before about sort of communicating with the DM, but also with your fellow players about like things that that you want to grab onto. Yeah. Um, as a DM myself, like I want to know those things because I want to set them up. Um, as a player, I am the I even like as a writer or as a player, I I need to ground my characters. I need them to be attached to things, and so I need to understand like. I need to either understand setting or have freedom to create setting. Um, and I need a backstory. Yeah. Uh, I'm not good in a vacuum at all. Um, <laughs> I have played games where I needed to be in a vacuum and I'm just like, I don't know what's happening. This is not what I do. This is not what I do. Uh, <laughs> so, so that's one piece is just kind of saying, here's like, you know, being able to go to the DM and saying, here are a bunch of things you can use. Right. Um, and these are the ones that I am really hoping will show up. Um, and as a DM saying cool pieces, um, and, and then also, you know, uh, like, like they both said, like being aware of like who your character is and where they are in their journey and how the stuff you're doing is affecting it. And not everything is going to be cause for a character moment for you. Um, but it might be for someone else. So being able to sort of like be the support character for someone else's moment can also move your character along their arc, right? Um, this is the this is what I love about multiple point of view and what sort of kind of ports over to D and D nicely is that like you can keep moving along an arc by sliding back and forth from like are you the are you the POV are you the focus um, and and that's so much like you know real life right like we're all going through our journeys and I still got to go to the grocery store right. um, and sometimes it doesn't matter that you're at the grocery store and sometimes you have profound realizations at the grocery store. Do you think that those little <laughs> How much do you think that those little things, like going to the grocery store or, you know, the, the little things that don't necessarily apply to the overall big picture, but those small detail yeah. things, how much, how important is that to a role-playing game and to, you know, a setting and telling the story, even well, though it's not part of the main story? I, feel, I was going to say, I feel like going to the grocery, the, go, the going to the grocery store of D&D is like, clear out this orc stronghold. Um <laughs> But <laughs> but I think I mean I think there's that's that's the thing is like whatever you add in like it should move something right, right? um you you that having a lot of sort of filler stuff um it's not my favorite as a player and so it's not my favorite as a DM like if I don't understand the point of this I don't necessarily want to do it I still as a DM prep a lot of extra combat just in case right uh but 
I've actually never had to use emergency combats. I just have them ready to go. <laughs> yeah. If somebody emergency decides combat. to jump off the boat, mm. you're going to have to fight a bunch of sirens. Sorry. <laughs> um, the, uh, but yeah, so I think that like there are moments that are not like huge that are that are sort of um, you know, like having those moments to sort of react to what happened, I feel like are really important to storytelling. Um, and they may not be the kind of game you're like, like I have, I have definitely played in games actually. So here's a quick story. Um, when I worked at Wizards of the Coast, I played in an Eberron game and I have this character. I loved this character. Its character was a warforged sorceress who thought she was the reincarnation of a little halfling girl. Uh, her name was Luca too. And I was so like, I loved this character and I was so keeping an eye out for moments for Luca's like core issue here which is that steadily she is realizing this idea that she's a reincarnated halfling girl is a lie that her father told her right this halfling sorcerer found her and said i can't cope with the death of my daughter you must be my daughter right and so like you know there was a moment where uh we came across a rogue creation forge and i was like this is it this is my moment and the dm's like and then you go back up to the surface because combat's over that was not a game that was built around story and role playing. It was a game that was built around encounters and combat. That was not the right game for that character. And honestly, it was not the right game for me. I didn't get to have my joy, right? right. I didn't get to have my character moments that I was like, and and I was being, I wasn't forcing them into the story because I was waiting for them to come up, but they weren't going to come up. Yeah. And it is okay if you have a game that's not heavy on the role playing, but you know, it's if your characters like the role playing, like that should be there right um so i've forgotten what the original question was well, somebody just posted <laughs> yeah. somebody just posted some crying faces in the chat and i'm like yeah i, I agree with that i feel kind of broken hearted for your character to not right. get that I, moment and then worse i was like well i could make her a novel character but i was the ebron editor so i was never going to get to write an ebron novel so pour one out for luca too uh. <laughs> pour it into my mouth <laughs> um Rana, how about you? Working your own? Did I already did I already ask you this? I, that, that, we went off yes, on a tangent I so. there. I think I think yeah, I was the last one. You are the last one. The that is did that I is absolutely the true. I was like sitting there waiting. Oh. Wait a second. That's everyone. That's the last one. Uh, yeah. Can I add something? <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, I've written a bunch of scripts, so I definitely think in terms of like you know arc climaxes, second climax, uh, but also fun and games. I feel like that that's like the one thing. Um, in D&D, when I DM, like, actual campaigns, I think of, like, when an arc ends, then I could have a couple of, like, filler in-betweens uh, episodes or uh, sessions. And um, those fun and game moments may not be related to... they can't. You could make a one-shot, you know, that's character-specific, and I've done that to great effect. Right. But uh, some of my players' favorite ones have been more neutral. Like, they just happened upon a festival... And there is a category for um, best dressed. And so all of the characters then must enter and use their own characteristics to try to win this contest, you know, for one reason or another. And it's usually really like unexpected and fun as to who wins and what they win with. And that's a different type of character development because it allows uh, each of the characters to express themselves in like a fish out of water situation. Yeah that allows them to even like discover something like the barbarian that never had worn uh civilized clothes before or had felt silk before suddenly discovers a taste for it okay. you know for example yeah i love it i, I, love I that. did i did remember why i was telling that story <laughs> <laughs> all right that so so what that game was missing and what was sort of like not necessary for that dm was there was no point of reflection we didn't do the thing complete the task and then sit with it and go okay now what's changed and i think that's the that's the place where you get a lot of space to kind of move your character in their story to sort of like sort of synthesize all this stuff that happened why does it matter we cleared out the orc stronghold why does it matter that we found a creation forge why does it matter that uh yang yang's barbarian got best dressed and i did not yeah. <laughs> like having a beat to kind of reflect back and sort of assess did we have a victory here did we have a loss here did i change did i see how i could have changed and i didn't you right. know did my friend have something big happen to them and i need to support them 
but now that reminds me of something else like those those sort of beats are not we don't necessarily always realize how important they are because we're it's very like inciting incident you know first attempt climax those are the big ones but you need a denouement to sort of like close it all off and say okay here was why we did this and i think that's the important part for for making sure you get your character beats in okay we have another chat question and this is this pertains to uh the stream when somebody goes off the rails and the gm needs a second to redirect how do you keep the stream moving so people don't get bored and i ask them do you, what do you mean by by so people don't get bored and they say optimally both the viewers and the players uh but but the but the streamers logistically <laughs> in character shenanigans <laughs> right like that's when you're like you're like let's have a conversation about this okay um, which works best when you have characters that you that are sort of complex and interesting and that you know each other's characters so you know what's the interesting conversation to go after okay um also on a stream you can go to break if you need to <laughs> yeah that's true totally yeah, I think you also answered it uh, partially earlier, Aaron. Just have like a back pocket encounter. Now this works better in uh, campaigns or uh, you know long form, like certainly like a one shot. You have certain story beats that you wish to accomplish in that one shot. So throwing in a random encounter so you could figure out like what's coming next um, probably won't work. But if you are running a campaign, then just have that you know just pull out that encounter from your back pocket and just uh, let your players fight. Right. And and I think um, I mean not having done as much jamming on on a stream, so I haven't had a chance to like encounter some of these, and so probably I'll yeah. <laughs> stumble real hard when I do. But I think that something I lean on is the fact that like I know these people; they're my friends. They have lots of experience too. Um, don't be afraid to like ask somebody to help you out with a rule or say like. Um, hey, I was thinking that we should go to break soon. Um, can we think of a reason that your characters would not go into the next encounter yet? Like sort of bring bring people in and ask their advice and ask um, them for what they'd like to do right. um, rather than trying to sort of maintain like that I'm mystical and I know all the answers and whatever because um, I don't. And I know that, you know, there's lots of experience there that, right. you know, that I can rely on so and if you've got players that are like you said if they're you've got players that are experienced just say hey i'm you know just let them know i'm not really prepped for that right now <laughs> uh <laughs> and then you know whichever whichever of these amazing suggestions any of you had just given uh you could just say hey we're gonna do xyz but yeah just i think letting yep. them know that you're not prepared for something uh because yeah you don't you don't have to be the all-seeing eye you don't have to be the the wizard of oz in that situation like you said Somebody asked, uh, Aaron, uh, mm -hmm. and it goes for all of you, but it's based on what you were just talking about. Uh, if your game is hack and slash, how do you create those story beats? Um, and I was thinking I that think too, like there are people that yeah. just want to roll dice. Yeah, and that might be not your game. I mean, this is the thing that, we, that's, that you know, at, at times in my gaming experience, I didn't fully appreciate, but everybody thinks of this game in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for some people, it is all about the numbers it is about like rolling dice and optimizing those dice uh and and for some people it's about kind of creating a story and the story is most important and the the rules are kind of a framework um and there's everything in between right and there's people um you know that that basically you know you have all your individual characters and there's a goal and everybody's going to be entertaining next to each other and then there's games where you are very invested in each other's characters and you're weaving a story together. And, and all of these are valid. And so if you are playing in a hack and slash game and you want to make your Warforge freak out because she can't cry, uh, you might be in the wrong game. But let's say these are your friends and you don't want to leave. You just want a little more character time. This is when you it's handy to enlist another player, I find. Um, because I if you can sort of just start sort of talking to the other player like the dm will give you that space even if it's hard for them to remember yeah. um that that's important to you i think if you just start doing it at the table then it'll be easier for them to make space because they may not you know if you're playing with someone 
like like my DM back then, who for whom the game is fundamentally a series of combat encounters and your cool backstory is just set dressing, um, you don't necessarily know when those beats are. You don't right. see when that moment of reflection needs to come because that's just like, that's the time it takes you to turn to the next page in your binder. Why right. would that take any time? Um, and so going in and claiming the space um, to make it happen is probably the best thing you can do. But also, I do think there is something to be said for like, look around. Is this the game you want to be in? Because um, it might be like that you want to play something different from what your your GM and potentially the rest of your table is playing. Right. And I think that's one of the great things that people can learn from this entire show, this stream, is that people are learning to be GMs or want to be a GM or haven't GMed or are super experienced but don't realize, hey, I've got to think about the players all want different things. So you have to keep that in mind, like, what does this player want? If I have four players that all want to do role-playing, but one guy who just wants to roll dice, I have to figure out how to balance that or figure out how to make make it work so that everybody can be happy. So that is definitely and, it. And I think, um, too, there uh, can be players who present as being very hack and slash, but are just shy, having been one of them right. in my early D&D yeah. &D games. Yeah. Um, and so... Um, it's worth, I think, like sort of taking people's temperature and then drawing the Shire players out because at, when I first began, like um, it was at a uh, gaming store, like they would run the game in the back room. And so I didn't know any of these people until I'd met them for this game and I was super duper shy. And the thing about um, rolling dice is that like so the uh, GM turns to you and says like, what are you going to do? You say, I'm casting this spell. They say, okay, roll damage. You roll damage and you say a number. Like, those are very, like, uh, regimented, like, easy interactions to have. You don't have to, like, worry about anything. You don't have to worry, am I good at doing voices? Am I role playing the right thing? Am I going on too long? Any of that sort of stuff. So I think that if you have somebody like that, that um, sort of, like, anytime they do, like, a tiny little bit, like, really rewarding that, I think is the key. Um, so uh, if they try to say what their character would say to like an innkeeper or something, right. not having the innkeeper shut that down because like, oh, you you rolled really badly on your persuasion roll. It didn't work. You said all that for nothing. Boom, failure. Like finding a way that even if it was a bad roll on the persuasion roll, that the fact that they said a little more to the innkeeper makes you sort of have it work a little bit better. And if you do that piece by piece, I think you can draw people into more than just rolling the dice. If they're sort of uh, of the per personality that likes it, just they're too shy yet. Yeah, totally. You agree. know what I love for that? Um, I I have a, one of the kids in my game, like, cannot, like, he just wants to hit things with, with his sword because he, he's, because he genuinely doesn't quite know what to say. Um, so I had an encounter that where they, they found this old woman and they had to, they could get, uh, something from her and I forget what it was. I think it was a magic item, but they had to give her a memory. Right. And so it was something where like they, they would say the memory and it would turn into a fish and swim into our pond. And so I say, tell me a memory of your character about a time that he felt very brave. Um, and he was a little squirmy about it, but I was like, what's the thing that would make you feel brave? And kind of walked him through like what you're going to do. And I think that's pretty specific to like, you're playing with a 10 year old and they've never done this before. But even if you're playing with someone and they're like, I'm not totally sure how to role play crafting those things where it's like, tell me, they want you to tell them about a memory. Tell me about a memory. They want me you to tell them about a goal you have. Or, or one of my favorites is, is something like you're dressing up for a party, right? Um, like, okay, what's your outfit for this party? Like, like give them space to like say something and describe something and give you a little more character information because so you as the DM can grab onto that, but then they're also getting that practice Yeah. Um, without like, just know what you're supposed to say when you're supposed to say it, which does feel like a lot. Right. Right. For sure. Yang Yang, I know you got to get going here in a sec. Uh, you want to give us uh, some of your social media where people can find you. Tell us a little bit about anything you might be having coming up. Uh, sure. You can find me on Twitter at two of the Yangs, uh, but really you can find me on the Dungeon Scholars Discord. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how to get the link here, um, but I'm sure, you know, you could help me out with that at some point. Um, 
but yeah, if you ever want to reach out to me, uh, Aaron and Rhiannon or any of the other Dungeon Scrawlers, we're all just hanging out in the Discord and like checking on it all the time. Um, we chat a lot about like D&D and games and writing and books and uh, being all writers ourselves. Uh, we do a lot of things like book giveaways. Um, yeah, otherwise I'm just working on uh, some game writing at the moment. Uh, I'm, working, I'm writing for two different video games and uh, I've written for a couple of sets of Magic the Gathering. Uh, the latest one that's coming out is uh, The Brothers War. So I did some text for that. So Ooh. check that out soon when it awesome. drops. Well, and I know that we have some some viewers, and I know some are in here right now that are big Magic players. So so that's really cool. I'm sure they're excited to go. Wait a second, that's him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just wrote some of the some of the flavor text, not all of it. Just that's some okay. Of it. That's 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 still really cool. I think I think that's cool. Huh? <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. And I know you said you're going to leave your try and leave your uh, camera going so that we don't have a re have to rearrange stuff. And I really appreciate that. And I appreciate you hanging out with us and and coming by so we'll definitely yeah, have to have you for back for a future episode and uh we sure. will yeah this is we great will fun push on without you have have a lot of fun with your, <laughs> with your event yeah thank you yeah happy halloween everybody who yes. celebrates it i should have dressed up rest. but i didn't <laughs> i know me too right um but yeah have a great thanks for having me and have a great uh rest of this podcast see awesome. y'all later see y'all later Bye. And again, everybody, you can go and check them out. I, the link is in the chat for Dungeon Scrawlers, twitch.tv slash Dungeon Scrawlers, like scrawling, like writing. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube after this has been live already, uh, you know where to find it. So, so there you go. All right. The next question for the two of you, and yep. I think you guys are going to have some decent input on this. We're going to talk about building a story for role playing, play as a player or a GM. How is that different than building a story as a writer and an author? Randy, you want to oh, give us a start? <laughs> oh boy, um, totally different uh, process. I right. feel like, um, because I mean, so I, I guess I'll start with. Um, characters because I've done more characters as a, a player but um, when I go into planning a character for a story or a novel um, I know by the end of getting ready to write what their whole arc is going to be um, but uh, doing a role-playing character I feel like I make a very open-ended arc so that it has a direction but I definitely don't know where it lands and how long it would take to get there or where it might zig or zag along the way um, and mud gaming, mud gaming, um, cause I made a lot of different characters for that sort of, I f gave me a bit of an intuitive feel of, um, what's a good open-ended thing and what's a bad open-ended thing as far as a character, because, right. um, for a novel, uh, a character arc could be that somebody is very closed off and doesn't make friends and doesn't like to talk to people. And by the end, they learn that they need to do that to, um, you know, triumph. Uh, but a role-playing character that is very closed off and doesn't make <laughs> friends and doesn't like to talk yeah. to people is well-nigh unplayable. So that's an extreme example, but you definitely don't want to do that. Right. Um, and uh, for, the, for the GMing side, like having only done a one-shot, um, I mean, I guess, like, there's a sort of similar level of, like, prep as far as, like, the locations and landscapes and setting that I would do for, say, a short story. Um, but uh, with a, a one-shot, it was very much more sort of a, um, what are some events or situations that, again, are open-ended, as opposed to um, how I do my short stories also is definitely, like, I have a sense of the whole shape rather than starting with an open-ended thing that I just explore into. Um, so I don't want to, um, you know, constrain any of the players by knowing the whole shape of what's going to happen. Right. Aaron, how about you? So I think as far as a player character, um, the way it starts, I don't think is too terribly different from a novel, ideally. Um, because I, I... I tend to have a sense of like, what is the question that will have to get answered? Um, and I tend to 
well, I mean, thus far I've written series mostly, so um, keeping that question a little kind of loosey-goosey is ideal um, because you know how long many books you're going to stretch it over. <laughs> That's the goal. Um, or you have a, you kind of, you know, you, you, you tend to get a sense somewhere in the middle there, how many more you get, but, um, and so there, you know, coming up with a question that has to be answered. Um, and, and then also, um, making sure that question is provoked by the external plot. Um, and so this is where it's really handy for the DM to know what this story is going to be about. Um, because if you have a character, if you build a character who is mm, struggling with their faith, right? And are they going to um, find uh, reconciliation with their God or are they going to uh, turn away from it? And what happens when they turn away from it? Great question. If you live in a world where gods are always a big old question mark, it's a different story than if you do live in a world where gods literally come down and say, hey, what's going on, bud? What seems to be the problem? <laughs> right. And it's a different thing from a world where your DM is going to say, there are no gods. These are all very different. Um, or if you know, if your DM knows that they're not going to touch the, the religion of the world is this backdrop that they are not interested in delving into, and you will never get to touch on that question, that's a problem, right? Um, the... Uh, like one thing I will say for dungeon scrawlers that was a little bit of a struggle in the beginning was that uh, we came up with characters and then we were told we would be in Westgate. And so finding ways for our characters to care about Westgate, which was a place that we had no connections to, right. was an ongoing process, right? That's a different. And so I, I have said, like, I would have built a different character if I had known we were going to be in Westgate and it was going to be about our relationship to the city. So ideally, that's what you do, right? You have a character with a question and, and you have to be OK with either answer to the question, right? Um, like... Uh, I have I have said before in Brimstone Angel, there were definitely versions of this where I was like, mm, Farida probably dies. Uh, and spoiler, she did. Well, mm, okay, anyway. So, uh, so you know, there are, there are ways that this shakes out that are maybe not good, and there are ways that it shakes out that are, like, success, and you need to be ready for either of these. Um, and that, ideally, it ties into that external plot. As a DM, right, like, the biggest thing thing is your players are your main characters so you need to make sure that they have the space to do all of the impactful action um games where you follow an npc and you basically sort of escort quest them uh i don't find fun and i don't think it would be fun to read about um you want the people who are the main characters to have the most agency and to have the most impactful choices so you're creating obstacles that they can only that they are best suited to tackle um and that they can tackle in the way they decide uh, i like when i come up with something to go okay how many ways could you go after this i if i can think of at least three i feel like that's a good one right um or you know that we have to get enough information to know the right way to do this well okay then i need to make sure that i have ways to get information that are things that people enjoy doing right yeah. like when we did the rashomon side of of dungeon scrawlers i know that rhiannon uh likes to have artemisia flirt with npcs so giving her npcs that are flirtable is going to be an entertaining <laughs> way for her to get clues right? right i know that yang yang likes to have stong be strong and so putting in a wrestling match Perfect. He can get in with those NPCs and get information from them. Because, like, if you just have... I saw this great Twitter thread earlier that was talking about how to make players engage with your NPCs, that it's basically the NPCs need to push out and, and be like, I want to be with you. I want to talk to you. I want to engage with you. Um, because that's the way that you can kind of pull them in. Um, because they're the main characters. All those NPCs exist for them, right? Right. Um, so having making sure they're the ones that do the impactful things, making sure the obstacles are ones that they can approach in an impactful way and that they're the best ones to do, which is like, this is the Forgotten Realms problem when people start realizing that you've got like Elminster around to fix things. You need to not like make, not be like, and here's Elminster, he's your next door neighbor because every <laughs> problem you're like, what if we just talk to Elminster? No, he's right. at town now. Like give them problems that they that they have to solve and that they are best for solving. And then ideally, you know what they're doing and you can help them give you can give them things. You can make give them a situation where someone drowning is important 
because someone drowning is the the important step on their character arc, right? Um, so you were sort of creating the the beats and putting them out there in an enticing way so that the players go after them in the way that like a main character does in a story because that's their job. Um, so that I think is the big difference. Whereas like when you are writing a novel, right, you are crafting it for the, the characters that you have chosen and they always yeah. make the choices that you want. Like you can't rely on specific choices. You need to have it be flexible enough so that those choices can like bounce around and move. Yeah, or have an idea what they're what those players are going to do, so that you yeah. can plan for them to do. Yeah, it that there's way. <laughs> there's like another conversation here about like how do you manipulate your players in particular. <laughs> that's, I always tell people that. I always tell people that like, well, this person, oh. if this person sees X Y Z happening, this is what they will do. So to get them to do what I want, I'm gonna have this situation kind of spontaneously kind of occur to get them to go, oh, I need to go take care of this NPC that I got to deal with because it's related when they normally wouldn't. Yeah, no, totally, totally, totally. Which is also like, it kind of ties into a writing thing. Like, like there is um, just, just down to like the prose level, the things you describe and the order you describe them in and how much attention you give to a particular detail sets in the reader's mind. I need to pay attention to that. And so it's similarly like, don't describe all the whole room, right? Yeah. You're like, it's a room about like this. There is a red chair in the corner. They're all going to be like, what's up with that chair? <laughs> right? Like the details that you give them, the more weight you put on something, the more important it is, um, which is, this is the thing, you know, Yang Yang was talking about things that he finds frustrating occasionally in, in published adventures. I find sometimes when there's a description, there are descriptions of things where they, there's, there's a description where they do this great, but then there's ones where they put lots of extra in. And I, if I read the box text and my kids go after it, I'm like, oh, it's an empty chest. I guess this may be a setting you up to be screwed by a mimic in a couple of rooms, but I didn't, uh, yeah, that's, that. now you're not going to pay attention when I say things because right. I put weight on the wrong detail. Right. Yeah, for sure. Were any of your characters directly based off of role-playing characters? And I think, like, did you, any of your characters in your books or stories, did you go, <laughs> did you write those characters going, I role-played this character, I ran across this NPC, and now I'm putting it in a story, or I'm putting it in a book? And sort either of. of you can jump in on that. So, <laughs> I will jump in first. Um, so, Farida was originally uh, a character I played. However, uh, they're totally different is the thing. Um, I got asked to audition for the Tiefling book, um, and I had been playing in a Forgotten Realms game where I played a Tiefling warlock named Farida, who had a twin sister, um, and they were raised by Dragonborn. Like, that was all part of it. However, my player character was older. She was, like, I think she was my age, so she was, like, in her late 20s. Um, she was very snarky, um, very deadpan. I had it was a fey packed warlock, which is Fun fact, this is why Farida can misty step, because I forgot that wasn't a warlock across the board power. Uh, <laughs> it was a, at the time, it was a fey packed warlock power that my character could do, but my book character should not have been able to do. But uh, then it was just so good for the, like, personality of the character that nobody made me take it out. It was just, it was, it was house ruled in, basically. Nice. Um, so then when it came time to, like, okay, I'm going to pitch this book, and I like this story... Um, it was like, okay, you know, this is going to be the story or, or like, I it was a little bit different. And then they said, we want this to be the start of a series. So what I ended up pitching was, you know, I need her to be younger. I need her, this to be the start of her pact. And this is a book about tieflings. So this really should be an infernal pact because the fact that they are descended from fiends is important. And a fey pact is just random. Right. So, okay. So, it's, but the same story, like, you know, this was Susan's character was my twin actually. Um, and she, uh, she wanted to, to kill one of every monster was her goal. She was a, she was a rogue, um, just did astonishing damage. Fourth edition rogues were just <laughs> something else. Um, and so she had caught, uh, like a master of the hunt, I think. And then my character had, he had, he had made a pact with my character, um, and that let him escape. So she was still mad about it. Right. Um, so, okay. I like the idea that she's a twin. I like the idea that she's a tiefling. But she needs a she and I like this this story, but but Tamora, who was 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 Susan's character, was 
there for Susan's game and Susan's joy and experience. She was not a perfect foil for Farida because that was not the point of her. She was not there to help me tell Farida's story. She was there for Susan to tell her story. So I stripped it back down and I was like, who's the character that that reflects off of this version of Farida? And then additionally, like, like the, the whole Dragonborn thing was cool, but it was like, it was too many. It was like the whole village raised them. And I was like, this is too confusing. I'm going to take one dragonborn. That's their dad. That's it. And the rest of the party, not there, off the table. Because again, that's the thing when you're taking a game, like you really do have to go, what is really critical for this story? And like, be willing to sort of tear it up by the roots. And a lot of the time, what other people are doing with their characters, even if you really admire it, is not actually going to t help you tell that character's story the best you can. So you need to be willing to change it to make it support better, or you need to cut it out, right? right. Like we had some, there were some fun characters in that campaign <laughs> that would not have made any sense. And I did, there were in the adversary, there is a chosen of, um, uh, what's his name? The masked drow god. I don't remember. That it's, guy. Okay. Someone in the guy? chat's gonna remember I'm that sure. guy. Um, who was based on our art director's uh drow um uh what's it called? The the magic sword elf thing. Anyway, his drow character, Phalar, right? And I put Phalar in the book because I loved Phalar. I thought he was funny. Um he and I bickered all the time. It was great. Phalar in the book never actually talks to Farida, but I got to kind of <laughs> take a little slice of this character that I enjoyed and put him where he fit. Okay. Um, and I think yeah. that was that was that was my experience of basing a book character off of an RPG. Here we go. Nice. <laughs> Brandon, how about you? Um, so Artemisia is my character in the Dungeon Scrawler's current sort of campaign. Right. Um, and uh, people who are super interested and want the like deep cut, um, she's actually in a short story that is published. Um, it's the derelict anthology from Zombies Need Brains. Um, and she is what's essentially in short story terms, the equivalent of an NPC, um, because the two main characters in the short story um, come into town and they're chasing some magic and they got to talk to somebody about what's going on in the town. And Artemisia happened to be a really good fit for somebody who's been living in the town, knows a little bit about the magic. Um, and I could just sort of like drop her in and she. Uh, fulfilled that purpose um, in that story. Um, there's another story I've sold, but um, uh, will be revising for the editor that'll come out, I think, 2023 or 2024, I forget. Um, and uh, that one's much more where um, I realized that um, having played a character in a long campaign, um, I had I had part of her arc, and I really wanted to just sort of like like you want to finish off hearing the end of a song, like right. to get the last like cadence. I wanted to think about what might be an ending for her arc that wouldn't necessarily be, you know, at the end of this campaign, we're going to sort of end in terms of like, okay, here's a little bit of the sense of like, they're going to go on and they're going to have their lives and whatever. But I really wanted to have the main character arc, like the climax and the denouement, and the thing about a campaign is that um, you can't stop and, like, stare at one person's character for long enough to have a whole damn climax and, or, you know, act th uh, two, three, climax, denouement. Like, that's not fair. And right. so I took her out and I put her into its, um, I think, technically a novelette. It's like 10,000 words. Um, so to get that, like, um, main character, climax, final, finishing off. It's a totally different version of her, but it picked up some of the same types of aspects of her character arc. So then I felt like I had sort of finished the song. It felt finished. Like right. I felt satisfied with it. And so I definitely um, took the character because I wanted to feel that sense of satisfaction in a way that where in a even a big long campaign, it's it's better to have like the feeling of uh, going forward into the future rather than sort of like finishing it off in a neat little bow. Right. All right. I got one more question for you guys. Where do you want to go as a role player, player or GM? Is there a place a a thing you haven't done that you're like i really want to do this i really want to run something that's like this or yeah. tell a story that's 
you know, XYZ story or in a setting or even a role playing system? Is there something you haven't really done that you really want to jump your feet into that you haven't gotten a chance to do yet? Go ahead, Aaron. Do you know, do you have an answer first? Rhiannon? I went first last time, so I figured I'd let Rhiannon? you go first. No, I, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I actually really liked DMing more than I expected to. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't think I could be all forever DM because I really love playing a character, but that's, I think, where I want to go. Um, because I can write books first, but, um, the, uh, I had this bananas idea for a uh, for a dungeon scrawlers season, but I think we hit similar notes, so I don't think we can do it. Um, but if, if I, that would be very fun, um, and then uh, but but more reality, I have a the other thing I had thought about doing. I had this idea. I had this idea that it would be really cool to do a stream like a maybe a three shot. Um, that was tied into Empire of Exiles because that just sounds like a fun way to promote it. Yeah. But honestly, um, the magic system is so different that I keep getting stuck. I'm just like, I don't know what you do. I don't know what you do. The world is so different. The magic system is so different that it doesn't feel like it j jives with D&D. &D. Then I have to go learn another system, which is totally fun, but not happening before the book comes out. Right. Um, and then I had another idea that's a book that I uh, have been working on, but I realized could be a really fun session with like giant kaiju gods or that, that I might do. I don't know. So anyway, I don't know. I have ideas. Also, I liked playing Glazia so much that I'm like, what if I just built a whole campaign around you guys all make a deal with Glazia and it's a bad thing, but it's also a fun thing. Mm. <laughs> I thought for sure you were going to say something about running an Eberron campaign or something like that with all of your time you editing. Know, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think, I, actually, I don't know. I do really like Eberron. Um, I'd have to like, kind of brush up on it because it's been a while, but um, that would be fun too. You think of anything, so, Given time to think. Yeah. Yeah. Given time to think, I did come up with some stuff. So uh, the, the first aspect of it is that um, I am doing another archaeology game for um dungeon squalors and it we're we're fighting the scheduling bbeg right now um but it's coming up and maybe in the next month or so okay. don't want to pin it down yet um and somebody has to finish the book first <laughs> <laughs> um uh but so i feel like that has been what has really sort of motivated me into doing gming is that um you don't see a lot of archaeology out there and people have a real hunger for it. Um, but I don't know that it would be a long-term thing because um, I feel like what interests me most about it is sort of the, the methods of archaeology. And I think to have a long-term campaign, you'd need to transition into what are you using these methods to find out? Right. Um, and I'm not somebody who necessarily is, is interested in the sort of deep historical lore kind of aspects of a game and so transitioning out of methods into like what are we finding out about the lore of the world would be sort of not as much where my interest lies um right. but um i i am trying something different with this new game because the first one i did was very much sort of like we have these existing characters and they need to find an artifact and so they are talking to the archaeologists about what the archaeologists are doing um, and in this next one, it's going to be changing that. So I told everybody, your character has to want to be here. And so it's going to be a little bit more of, um, can you convince these archaeologists that they should hire you? Um, can you do archaeology? Can you sort of problem solve about archaeological problems um, rather than be like trying to find an artifact or something like that? And I don't know if it'll work. Maybe people will be like, no, no, I want to go artifact hunting after all. Um, but I think that's what motivates me is, um, using, uh, TTRPG to, uh, give a window into something that I know about and people are curious about, right. um, but isn't really sort of shown very much, which is the actual sort of like methods and, and actually doing archaeology rather than sort of dramatizing it for a movie or something. Yeah. And that's super cool because when you, when, when we chatted, for those that don't know, that are watching and listening uh both of these people have been on the podcast that we do uh both interviews were amazing and fun but we chatted about your 
that you know that particular game that you did on dungeon scrolls yeah. where you were doing the archaeologist and i thought that was fascinating i thought that was a great idea and i was like man i need to go and find that episode just so i can watch it because it just <laughs> sounded so cool so i'm i'm excited when that uh when that episode is about to come up that you're gonna do i need to know so i can clear my schedule so i can come <laughs> and make sure to watch because i try to get in there when you guys are on i try to get in there and you know get the numbers in there and and everything to to try and to try and do my part to help out uh, but sometimes I only get to watch like 15 minutes to an hour. I don't get to watch sure. the whole dang thing. Cause usually very oftentimes I'm also doing something at the same time. So. <laughs> There's that problem. Yep. So yeah, yeah so I'll definitely have long. to, you'll definitely have to let me know when you, uh, when you get that little game going. Cause I'm really curious. Cause I, I always thought archeology span was really cool. Um, and it's definitely totally not because of Indiana Jones, which we've discussed. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the the inaccuracies uh, of of uh of some of that so all right yeah i think that's all of our questions uh so with that being said we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about you guys are you ready to talk about you guys we're going to start yep. with rihanna and held yes. also known as well, rz held can i say one more dming thing yes of course. Down? so of i course was writing down things that i that i'm like oh what do i know from writing that uh goes out to um dming um and there are two things that i didn't manage to say so i'm gonna say them really quick okay uh one people like to be surprised they don't like to be tricked so don't withhold all the information and then go boom um they want to kind of like put it all together and go oh i should have caught it that's really fun but if it's like no you never could have figured it out that's mean no one likes that no one yeah. likes it in a novel no one likes it in a game and the other one i wrote down is don't save it for the sequel um as an editor, I knew a lot of authors who were like, I'm not going to put the cool thing here. I'm going to put it in book three. But then book two is boring. And the thing about <laughs> d d is there are so many big, crazy things. Just throw them in. It's okay. Like, you'll find another crazy thing for later. Like, you right, can, if they something. figure it, yeah, if they figure out the, if they figure out what's going on faster, cool. Like, have the confrontation and then before the next session, like, think about like, okay, now what? What else could be going on here? You can, there's so much stuff to pull from. And it's fun when it gets bananas. I love the end of the R Rashomon split when someone, they went, were, were going into the Argent Palace to drop the, the turns out the wand of Orcus on Gratz and Orcus showed up and then someone bought the Tarask with their channel <laughs> points. So, okay, we're going to fight Orcus, Gratz, and the Tarask. And it was crazy <laughs> and complicated, but I hope it was a lot of fun to watch and to play in because it was absolutely banana pants. And I think when it gets to be banana pants, like... As a player, you're like, all right, let's just pull out all the big guns. Like, I'm not saving this. I'm not saving this big like like centerpiece spell for later because later is now. You know, so, you okay, said, those you are the last couple things. I you said book, you on. said you said don't save it for book three because then book two will be boring. Well, and if book two is boring, there might not be a book, no three. book three. Exactly. <laughs> Nobody will buy it. Nobody will want to see book three. So yeah, throw it in there. Oh, sorry. What do you have going okay. on? What stuff do you have coming up? What books do you have coming out? What stories do you have? Tell us all about all of your things. Okay. Um, so as far as other streams, um, the Dungeon Squalor stream, uh, stream um, Wednesdays at 6.30 Pacific. Um, we're doing a bunch of different sort of stuff, and there will be the archaeology episode, uh, TBD. Um, and uh, I'm also uh, guesting in November um, on a Court of Blades game. Um, the uh, Val word on the Speculate channel, um, which is very interesting because I've never done Court of Blades before. So, um, and uh, as far as books, um, if you liked the archaeology talk, um, I recommend that people look at my um, Silver series, specifically the collection, the um, Ladies' Children has a couple of novellas with a archaeologist who does werewolf archaeology. Um, and you don't have to have read the whole series to understand what's going on in the collection because the character doesn't know anything about werewolves either. So you learn with her. Um, and then uh, under my other pen name, RZ Held, um, there's the Amsterdam Institute uh, series of novellas. So you can either get um, Clean Install is the first of those novellas or the first four collected in a print edition because sometimes people prefer print um, called Idyllian. Um, and those, as far as their, like, archaeology, there's no archaeologists in them, um, but I think a lot about the um, culture, and since it's over uh, a long time period, um, the novellas are set at different times, um, I can look at how cultures might change 
and they're sort of like heroes of the past might not be heroes in the future, um, stuff like that. So um, if any of that interests you, or if you just want like uh, lots of action, um, flirting, uh, sexy space opera, um, those are the ones for you. <laughs> Our website That's is rhiannonheld.com. Yes. And you are at Rhiannon Held on, no, Twitter. on Twitter. Do you have any other social medias you want to plug or anything else you want to shout out? Nope, or those, other are, those are the main ones. I will still be on Twitter for the moment. I, I'm sort of getting out of the habit now of like plugging my Twitter, but that's where I'm going to still probably be hanging out for the moment. So Agreed. Totally understand. Aaron, you totally don't have anything new that just came out right now really recently, <laughs> right? Not, it's not, not out nothing. yet. It's out yeah. soon. Soon. Um, soon. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Aaron M. Evans uh, because I don't I don't want to learn a new social media right now. We'll see. Um, the uh, yeah, my new book, which I flashed at you earlier, this blur thing's gonna get me. Right. Empire of Exile yeah. uh, comes out on November eighth from Orbit. Um, it is uh, you can pre-order it now, and if you pre-order it now and you go to my Twitter, uh, I have this cool pre-order swag, which includes these cool art cards. Oops. That turned out really good. That's awesome. And these stickers with this this dumb rabbit skull that I love so much. <laughs> um, and a cool, cool bookmark and back. Anyway, fun stuff. Fun stuff to get because you pre-ordered. Because pre-orders make a big difference. Publishers uh, look at those numbers and decide very early whether a book is doing well. So um, it is uh, my first non-tie-in novel. Uh, and it is, um, it is a murder mystery that is set in a secondary world. And uh, if you liked Brimstone Angels, in particular, if you liked Ashes of the Tyrant and uh, The Devil You Know for all that crunchy dragonborn lore, um, this is me without the uh, without the, the training wheels on. This is me building my old dang world. And there are currently six threads on Twitter about uh, what exactly the world building is like. So uh, awesome. the premise is a uh, thank you. Um, this is a world where basically a uh, slow rolling catastrophe has destroyed most of civilization, but uh, the remnants of 10 nations have made it behind uh, a wall that prevents those, those shape changing hordes from getting in um, and have formed uh, their own little empire, that empire of exiles. Uh, and uh, the, you know, the story takes place a uh, hundred years after that. And 20 years after a failed coup to overthrow the, the imperial authority, um, where a, uh, you know, basically a, like a monk lawyer, because that's how they do things, uh, Quill goes to uh, request artifacts from the imperial archives uh, and finds out that he's kind of ensnared in the uh, in, a, in a conspiracy that involves the remnants of that coup when his best friend uh, murders a politician and then utters a cryptic phrase and cuts his own throat. So he's very good, kind, lovable, cinnamon roll best friend, you guys. So that's a big problem. <laughs> spoilers. That's Somebody's like, small. spoilers. <laughs> it's in the cover copy. That's in it. That doesn't count. I used to, when I was an editor, I used to get into it with authors sometimes because I would write their cover copy and they're like, oh no, you can't tell anybody about that. I'm like, buddy, that's the point of this book. If I can't tell them about this, all I can write is it's about some guy in Eberron. Like, <laughs> you've got so many other things going on here. The setup is this, right? Um, so that's the setup, right? There's a murder, suicide, political incident, and it shouldn't have happened. So what did happen? Um, and it is all kinds of good. If you like Brimstone Angels, it has got the same kind of found family and uh, deep character relationships. Uh, and again, lots of world building that is about what is right in front of the characters. Um, and yeah, and I've tried my hand on a murder mystery, which was fun and also crazy making. <laughs> you know, I was super excited. So for those that are watching, they know that I, I do a podcast where I interview people such as yourself. And I know I've probably said this to Aaron a bunch of times off stream or in Twitter or wherever, but we had uh, right after Gen Con. All right, Salvatore was on the show and we were chatting and I just kind of randomly like, who are you reading right now? And he like had this blurb <laughs> about Aaron, like, oh, well, there's this, you know, I don't really read a lot of books, but I picked up Aaron's book and it was so amazing. It's so good. And he just went on. And I was yes, like, and in the back of my head, I was like, I know Aaron. She was on the show. She's super <laughs> awesome. This is so cool. I'm totally going to share this with her. 
Yeah, he blurped the book. It's a detailed and mysterious, a place to explore and relish. Highly recommended. Which uh, I asked him if he could blurb it. And and he was like, I am super duper busy. I don't know if I can. Um, maybe I can just write something about how I think you're a great author. And I was like, that would be amazing in and of itself. If you Whatever you can do, please thank you. Um, and then I guess he decided to read it. He read, yeah, he read the whole thing. So he's like, he's yeah. read the whole thing and he, was, he yep. said he, he couldn't really put it down. I talked to him a little bit afterwards because I told him that you are yeah. on the podcast or whatever. And he was like, oh, that's really cool. And so, yeah, he was... He was gushing about the book, but he was trying not to give me spoilers on the book. So, so yeah, it, it was, is, it it was is really definitely, cool. definitely a, got a got a bunch of twists that once you've read it, you're like, okay, well, can't tell you all of this, but what can I tell you? Yeah, awesome. Well, <laughs> there's hey. there's there's the octopus people in it. Well, the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you both for being on the show today. Uh, I want to thank Yang Yang. I know he's 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 gone. He had to step out, but I want to thank all three of you for being on the show and joining us today. It was a lot of fun. Uh, hopefully, you guys had a good time, and hopefully, you guys yeah. are willing to come back for future episodes. Oh heck um, yeah! yeah. Uh, I do want to tell the people that are watching this. Obviously, isn't the last episode of the Game Masters Workshop. Far from it. Uh, Usually we do this once a month. It's usually the last Saturday of the month. The next one isn't so much because of the holiday season. I, I'm only going to do one for November and December, but I made sure that it's going to be good for you all. We're going to be having Ed Greenwood. We're going to have Jason Bullman, and we're going to have Matt Forbeck as our guests. Those are our three guests, and that's going to be on December 3rd. So if you like any of those three, obviously Ed Greenwood is the father of Forgotten Realms. We talked about Elminster earlier. Amazing, great person. Uh, Jason Bullman creator of the Pathfinder awesome. role-playing game. Yeah, do you write it in here? <laughs> nice. <laughs> Jason Bullman, uh, you know, created the Pathfinder world, basically. Uh, he's got all kinds of stuff going on. He's also got his own Patreon, things like that. So another amazing content creator. And Matt Forbeck, I I can't list what he's done because pretty much he's had <laughs> no his hands on ev What hasn't he touched? What hasn't well, he touched? You will pass out from fatigue before you get through the entirety of matt's bibliography right it's like i could i guess that we could start and just do okay this is how about let's just talk about role-playing games he's worked on okay we'll talk about in the last third, five years. in the last yeah in the last <laughs> in the last five years so uh, and he is obviously currently working on the um the marvel role-playing system which is super cool so uh that is going to be december 3rd uh we talked about the podcast everybody this monday Two days from now, Halloween night, uh, we're going to have a game designer known as Siegfried Trent who works with Evil Genius Games. They've got their new Everyday Heroes that's coming out and all of their stuff. They've got a lot of tie-in uh, publications for pop culture movies. So you want to roleplay Total Recall? You want to roleplay Pacific Rim? Highlander? The Crow? Rambo? They're going to have stuff for all of that. So that is going to be on Monday, and we're going to talk about that system, how that works, how coming up with that came together, the entire the entire shebang. So if you guys uh, are interested in some of that, join us on Monday at 6 p.m. Central Time. So for Rhiannon Held, a.k.a. RZ Held, Aaron M. Evans, I am Nick, and thank you all for hanging out at the Game Masters Workshop. You can find past episodes on YouTube as well as the past podcast episodes on YouTube as well. Thank you so much and have a great evening.